This psalm, Psalm 37, was written by David in his older years, and it contains his experience with God's providential dealings with men, both righteous and wicked. And although uh, we can say there are many admonitions and words of encouragement, a prayer for deliverance or even an outcry, like some other of the prophets might have said, how long, O Lord, is not there. It's kind of interesting. It's almost as though when David put all this out, it is indeed a juxtaposition of two kinds of people. And you will have to forgive me, but I need to keep repeating this so that people can begin to crystallize this thought process. And I'm sorry, within Christendom, within the faith, there are only two types of people. I've often referred to the two types of people when we we start talking about money and giving. There'll be people who have that Judas mindset. That's wasteful, and we could do so much more with this money if we just didn't waste it over here, and yet that's the same person that, if you know the story of Judas, versus those people that would look at the woman, for example, as I've mentioned many times, with the alabaster box, putting, breaking that ointment on Jesus. And the question asked was, you know, isn't that wasteful? Why this waste? So there'll always be two types of people. Here, uh, David kind of separates the two, righteous and wicked. I don't want to say unrighteous, but deliberately, because so many times in this psalm, wicked, wicked, wicked. So I want to stay with the verbiage that's contained in the psalm. Last week I covered from about verse 1, and I think we went down to verse 11. So today I'm going to pick up at verse 12, and I'm going to start by putting some words on the board, and hopefully I can split the board a little bit. So the first word that I want to highlight is what is contained in that first verse. We're looking at uh, verse 12, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. And it's kind of interesting because the way I've broken this down, we'll do all the words on the board. There are a couple of verses of scripture that I wanted to put in here. One of them, many times we'll read in Proverbs. I'm, you know, I'm not a big Proverbs fan. It's not my, the book that I, I stay the most in. I think you know that. But you'll find in Proverbs a repeated theme of those who sow discord, those who sow discord among the brethren, those who are constantly sowing discord. There's a reference to that in Proverbs 6 and in Psalm 21 where it says that essentially those who are constantly working evil or plotting evil against, and actually it's not against the individual, but actually against God and his plans. So the plotting of the wicked... First, you've got to almost start in historical realm so we can kind of put some flesh and blood on this. From the Bible, the plotting of person against person, you've just got to go to the book of Genesis. I mean, I'm not taking you there. I'll just talk about it. What would make a brother rise up against a brother? That's the story of Cain and Abel. And honestly, if I didn't have this message laid out in front of me, that would be a fine place to camp out today. What makes a brother take up against a brother? And I can't, and I don't, still to this day, understand. It seems like if you look at the history, beginning with the history of humankind that's chronicled in the Bible, whether you say that it was jealousy or that one brother failed to follow God's desires or wishes on how to bring an offering properly, but it brought two brothers to clash and one to raise up another against another to kill. So this type of plotting is age-old. And as I said, all you've got to do is look inside this book, and it's chock full of these type of plots against other people. If you go a little bit further, and you might remember last week I mentioned Mordecai, out of the book of Esther. But I ask you something, and again, try and don't think of these as old-timey and archaic and age-old, but try and think of them in current, in light of current events. As I mentioned, Cain and Abel. Why is it brother raises up against brother? In this case, 
Here is Haman, the, probably the wealthiest man at that time. And the king was kind of gripped with Haman. I want to say he might have been a little bit uh, over the top about him. He gave him special place, special prominence, and a decree is given that all should show deference to Haman. And it's Mordecai, the man who basically adopts his cousin, who is Esther, for the book is named after her, he refuses to bow down to Haman. And whether it's because he wore an idol around his neck or he knew that bowing down to uh, Haman, who is of the lineage of Amalek, which is the age-old enemy of the children of God, whatever his reason was, he would not break his principles or his vows or his ideology and it was Haman that began to plot against Mordecai. Not only it was, I should say, something that's always uh, forgotten in that story, which is that Haman set out actually to destroy the Jews of 127 provinces in the surrounding area, but it was Mordecai that became the ire for Haman would not tolerate anybody who wouldn't bow down and do obeisance to him. So again, the question is, If it is within one's convictions, and I'm talking here spiritual convictions, then why should, for example, why should I uh, cater or bow down to? If it's something that I have come to the belief of through this word, then why should I alter it for someone else? So this type of plotting is, as I said, age-old. You could go to other Old Testament passages such as Absalom. There's a perfect one for you there. Absalom not only (laughs) is against his brother, but eventually will be against his father, David. And that creates its own plotting madness. And the question is, why? One would have to be looking at all of these individuals and saying something evil has overtaken. Something wicked has entered into the heart. Now, we don't start off, contrary to what the world and some of the church preaches... We do not start off as good. Anyone who tells you that is misinformed, and you can say, well, are you saying that babies are bad? No, babies are not bad, but babies are born in the same condition that you, when you were a baby, were born. I hate to tell you, but it's all the same. We're born in the image of fallen Adam, and it takes that, we'll call it commission and providence of God, which I've often referred to out of John 3, Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night and asking, how is a man saved? And how does he essentially gain life eternal? And Jesus says the answer that has perplexed more people when he says you must be born again from above. And interestingly enough, if you really think about it, without being born again from above, Are there good people in the world who are not born again, who are not Christians? Absolutely. But we're speaking of something that is to the follower of Christ, something that should be understood as plain as day. People were changed after listening to Jesus Christ. People were changed after coming in contact with him. People were either healed or they mocked. People either came to faith and trust or they acted in other disbelief. And some stayed in the middle. And as I said, there's never a middle point. You're either, as Jesus said, you're either for me, gathering with me, or against me and scattering. These are the concepts which this psalm actually speaks of. I could take many New Testament passages and put them right onto this psalm and say it's exactly what we see in the New Testament. The unfortunate thing is that people will do what they do best, which is be people, and human nature will be what it is. A lot of these people who plot, I have yet to see somebody plot against a good individual that their plot was not cruel in some way, shape, or form. The plottings of the wicked are usually determined. And when I say that, I don't mean predetermined. I mean determined. They, they have their mind fixated 
and there is nothing that you or I could do to dissuade them on their plot to carry out against those who are, we'll say, trying to go God's way. Now, I said this is current, and it is indeed current. So let me just hang this whole message of what I'm going to do on one passage that is verse 23. It says, if you read verse 23, the steps of you see good is italicized. Anytime you see italics, it's added by the translators because there was a little bit of difficulty in trying to figure out what that word should be translated as. I'll get back to that in a second. But I want to hang this whole message on. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Let me talk about that so then I can get back into my list, which I'm going to build for you today. If you're reading the Hebrew, it's very easy to see that the word that is used, this is why the translators had to use that word good in italics, the word being used in the Hebrew, we've got several words for man. If you were reading, Adam is one of them. You have another word, Ishi. Here, let me write them in phonetically, Adam, Ishi, or Ish. But this word here, is the Hebrew word, which is kind of interesting, geber, which, if you're familiar, it is related to several other words that come from this uh, trilateral, the consonants, gimel, bet, resh. If you trace the word back, it means mighty or strong, here it's simply, this is why they did this, they used the adjective good, man, but it is the steps, miyawa, me, tseul, geber, ko wana, nu, that is God, if I put it in right order, orders the steps of this individual. This individual is focused. His strength comes from the Lord, but it does not necessarily insinuate that this individual is a strong warrior. That comes from a root attached to this, to this group of words, but right here we could just say the, the strength or the strong individual, but the strength is not in themselves. It comes from him. So why is this important? Because if God is ordering, and let me just speak of that Hebrew word for ordering, which I wrote down a whole bunch of words here, to be firm, to be strengthened, to set at order, to direct, to establish, to prepare. So you get the idea with Hebrew's ambiguity, we have a lot of words we can fit in there for order. Imagine replacing, for example, order with the steps of that individual are established, they are prepared, they are strengthened, they are firm. So it gives you an idea. It's not just saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, but rather God will give you the ability. He provides. So let's hang all of what I'm going to say on this verse 23. And instead of trying to make this, I want this to really hit home. When I say the steps are established, they're ordered, they're set, as opposed to the individual who's plotting and whose ways are not. That will come out in the next grouping here that we're going to go to. So the next, the next P word, and they're, they're all probably going to be with P, so that keeps it easy. This would be number one. Number two, we have those who... Persecutor, the persecutors. And I'm taking this grouping out of verses 14 and 15. The wicked have drawn out the sword. They have bent their bow, bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of an upright conversation or behavior. If you read on verse 15, their sword shall enter their own heart. Their bows shall be broken. So there's something there to speak about. I'd like to say that it would be really good for us to focus in on that in these verses. These are the type of people who will either, you know, it says here they have drawn out sword. I want you to think of 
the sword in this day and age as their mouth. All right? And that is the common wielded thing that's careless. People say things, whether it's in the moment, whether it's to be just mean and cruel, as I mentioned earlier. But I want you to think of it that way. And what I love about this psalm, it was written by David, who was a man after God's own heart. It's as though David is saying, and I put it very colloquially, what goes around, will definitely come back. You're in this day and age, people like to use the word karma. I just prefer to say, trust me, if you're serving up a good mouthful of vitriol, it will come back on you eventually. God ensures that. It may not come back in the form of words, though. So be very careful about what might be dumped on you while you dump on others. With that being said, you've got a good image here um, for what these people do. So I think I've said enough on that. Uh, Let me read down into verse 16 and 17. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Let's talk about this next one because it has to do with prosperity, but not in a good sense. You know, we tend to think many times we see a lot of these people seem to be prospering while they are basically wielding the sword of their mouth. People are paying attention. Crowds are gathering. People are listening. What's going on? And so I kind of looked at this and I thought to myself, here's the difference that's really starting to be pulled apart because this whole psalm actually is a juxtaposition between two types of people. And I keep telling you, there's only two types of people. Those, for example, if you look at what's saying, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many. Why? Because it is implied that the little that the righteous man hath, he probably got it with integrity. He probably worked for it. He did not do it in a dishonest fashion versus if you think about the character that's being laid out here, It's not necessarily clear, but you could say that the character of these individuals may have obtained their prosperity through other means other than the way that by God's blessing. In other words, if you read down, you'll find out the picture of the difference between these two individuals is in verse 21, in fact. It says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. These are the two camps, by the way. I talked about those two uh, separate camps of thought process towards money in the church. And let me ask you this, when you talk about prosperity, because I've met a few of these in my life, you ever met somebody who has asked you for money and not paid you back? Well, I've had people in my lifetime, you know, they'll, please, 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 you know, they'll, they'll make all the vows, they'll make all the promises in that moment, And then they're gone. They don't care. It doesn't matter. Their integrity, their reputation, their words mean nothing. And you'll always find people being critical of the individuals who even after they've been taken advantage of still turn around and want to help other people. I've been accused of this myself. People say, why would you help that person? Because, Or why would you keep helping individuals? Well, that's the spirit of God in me. That's not me. If it was me, I'd just say, go pound sand. The Spirit of God in me says, you keep, you keep doing, you stay the course. No matter what is going on, you stay the course. God's going to see your heart and know why you stayed the course. Not because others can see it, but because that was what was in your heart that God placed in your heart for you to do. But I, I always think this. These verses tell me of a little bit of the mind of David when he says, a little that the righteous man hath is better. Why? Because the little that the righteous man hath is the provision that God has given. And it may be little in the eyes of the one who has a lot, but to the one who has whatever he has, looking at it from the perspective of it's from God, it's sufficient, it's enough. So these are definitely two ways to look at things. But let me keep, keep going on here. Verse 18, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed 
in the evil time and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. You know, I may actually talk about this in my next message because this this psalm has a tremendous amount of uh, verses in it that speak of the Lord's provisions. And when I say provisions, I don't want you to just think money or food. But it's as if if you read this, especially for people in this day and age who feel like they are just being plowed over and you're not being heard, the Lord knows how to take care of his. If I, if I put a subtext on this, is the Lord knows how to take care of his children. And I'd go back to that verse that I highlighted, um, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I want you to think about this. As a mother has a child, and that child begins to walk, and we've all seen that baby's first step, kind of sloppy and clunky and um, wobbly, falls down, and here comes mom or dad to pick the child up and set them back on their feet again, and a couple of more steps assisted, and boom, down we go again until the legs are strong, and it's understood how, to, how movement and motion naturally works, but the parent is there to guide the child. This is what our Heavenly Father does for us. He's there, just like the, child, the illustration of the baby taking its first steps, constantly there when it says, the Lord upholdeth. The Lord is always ready to pick us up if we'll acknowledge this is the thing. And many times, our failure is failure to recognize that that is why we call him our Heavenly Father. He is there beyond the earthly mother or father, parent, to help pick us up, to help guide us. When I say about establishing, preparing, uh, securing, those things that as a parent you would do for your child, how much more our Heavenly Father? So it's important to kind of put these all out and see. Uh, let me add one more Actually, I have a few more words here. Uh, I, want to, I want to add one that wasn't on my list, which I like this one a lot. Yep, you, you said it first, punishment. That's a strange thing to put up on the board, but we're talking about a diversity, two types of people here. So punishment. Can you imagine being in the category of those people who are constantly plotting, constantly scheming, and not recognizing. See, this is the problem I even have with my enemies. But I have it in general and in a broader plane. And that is, you know, there are a lot of people in that book who you'd say, you know, their character might not be exactly what you'd expect of a man or woman of God, yet God chose them, God called them, and God will keep protecting them doesn't mean that he will, he will embrace or condone evil or their missteps. But being called by God, I think to myself a lot of times, these people forget there will be a punishment for them that will be outside of the normal. And why do I say that? Because the scripture says, touch not God's anointed. Now, there's a lot of people who would like to line up and say, oh, I'm anointed, I'm anointed. When you hear that, go the other way. That's not the line to be in, okay? The ones that are so quick to open their mouth like that, those are the ones you have to watch out for. But what I am saying is that the punishment, if you go back and just pick up a little bit of history and the people that I mentioned, you see, God will not let certain things go. Now, in this day and age, people seem to think, well, God's not doing anything, so it doesn't matter. But trust me when I tell you, I want you to think of your life as a long grocery bill, right? Being added up at the checkout stand. Now, God's not going to be checking off each item. Why? Because he's seen the big picture. He's been with you every day. He knows all about you, the good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. But the good thing here is when I say see your life like that, it's all being recorded. It's all being chronicled. At some point... God knows the difference between your reaction to something, perhaps even out of, out of line of what the Bible says, but knows your heart, versus those people who are determined to do otherwise, and that's all they do. Now, those people who are determined to do otherwise and keep coming against 
those people of God do not think for a minute that God has not prepared something a little extra special for that group, because he has. You know, somebody once asked me, well, you know, what do you think? You talk about bad being punished. Uh, I can't tell you. It's not my job. It's not my position to say. Who knows, for example, and I've said this many times. It's been said here for years. You don't know. Let's talk about evil personified and Adolf Hitler or Mao Zedong or Lenin. We don't have the capacity to know what happened in the final moments of their life. Whether they were, you never know. You could say, but that was evil personified. But what about what happened in the last moments of their life? What might have been in their heart? Maybe they cried out to God. I don't know. I'm not the judge. That's God's business. So it's not for us to say except to know that God will deal with and meet out, especially against those who the Bible says to those that are the apple of his eye. Don't think that this type of behavior goes unnoticed by God. I should add one more P word here because I talked about it, and that's pledge. And I referred to this earlier about those people who will borrow money and not pay it back. And those are the same people that will vow vows, pledge pledges, and not fulfill them. And what I'll tell you is exactly what the Bible says, it's better to not make one than to break one. And that goes, by the way, not just for money. That goes for things that people pledge, including fidelity to their spouse, to their family, or to their friends. You make a pledge... I've said this before, I've made pledges and vows and promises many times, and a lot of times I keep them to my own hurt. Why? Because I opened my mouth and I said a thing. So we're now looking at two different people. Let's compare what happens. If this category here is uh, the wicked category on this side, what I'm going to put for those righteous, my first one will be the path. And I chose, I think, mostly P words. Path. This is a delicate one. You know, I just said, quoting that verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But I want to talk about a path, which is something that we should all consider. Because, we, you know, I've, I've said this publicly before, but it's good for us to reflect on this for each and every one of us. Some of us, some here, were raised in a Christian home. They grew up, and I'm going to be specific now, they grew up in a Protestant home, whatever your denomination was, you were born and raised, mom and dad took you to Sunday school, you were born into the faith. It doesn't mean anything, when I say that, it doesn't mean that you will have the faith of your parents A lot of times people are born into a family that's very uh, faithful and very committed, and the children are not so committed. But the path that you are on today, it's important to look at how you and I got here. Now, I'd like to tell you in, in real time, you know, a lot of times we want to say, I did this thing, you know, we want the credit. I can tell you, I think my life is pretty miraculous. I never planned to be here. (laughs) I never imagined I would be standing behind a pulpit every Sunday morning talking to you about God's word. But there was a path that when I didn't know there was a path, there was a path. God's plan in my life when I didn't even know God, which we call prevenient grace. What brought you here today? What brought you to the faith? What brought you? You can say, well, you know, some, some people will they'll share the stories of how they first started listening to Dr. Scott. And many of those stories come out of the 70s and the 80s where people and some pretty uh, interesting folks, but some of them were bikers and hippies. Some of them were getting high and stoned out of their mind while they were watching Dr. Scott because he was just kind of out there. And I guess maybe if you're high, it all sounded right or out there. I don't know. (laughs) But I think to myself, there can be no accident there. 
something made it so that you had the opportunity. Now, it, then it becomes free will. You have the choice. You have the opportunity to say, wow, I'm really interested in this, which is probably God already working and primed the pump for you to say, I'm already interested and I'm curious, or the ones that walk away and say, no, thank you. This is the path I'm talking. This is the ordering of the steps I'm talking about. Not just ordering your steps in the now to the future, but what he has already done. And this is why it's important to understand that these two groups of people, unless God does something radical, will never meet in the same mindset. Because I can look back and I can say, through all the folly, through all the crazy stuff, through danger, through all kinds of things that have happened in my life, the Lord put me on a path and have I stayed on the path clearly? No, there's been times I've kind of wobbled, like, like my illustration of the child falling down and being a little bit wobbly, but the Lord's been there to pick me back up and set me back on my feet. And I can say like the psalmist, I, I thought for sure my foot had slipped, but then I can also say, but God, who is rich in mercy and grace, sees my folly and my frailty, but knows my heart. It's not perfect but it is set on him. So my path is much different than those embedded in the words of this psalm because he cares. It matters to him. You know, I think a lot of times we think, oh, God doesn't care. You know, today's, whatever I do today, whatever I take in today, even from this message, you know, some people, I think it's a habit. They tune in or they listen. It's a habit. Versus maybe today, the words are not just words coming out of my mouth, but they're sinking in. That God actually has a plan for your life. And that may sound very cliche, but God has put you on a path that's brought you here to this place for right now. And maybe if you look back far enough, you'll see God was leading all the time. And the path that he set you on has separated you out. So that's my first word for those the next one I want to highlight, and I don't want to miss this one, for those on the other side of the ledger, let's put this as wicked. And here is the path. We'll put righteous, righteous ones. So the next one I want to put here is provision. I touched on it, but I want to highlight this. It's the age-old battle. And let me talk to you about this because it's the age-old battle with the church. Heaven's arithmetic, most people are not schooled in. God's economy, people don't understand. You know, you may be savvy in the stock market and, and the, how things work in the world, but how things work with God is pretty important. And... I'm going to say that if you keep looking, verse 25, I quoted this last week. It says, I've been young, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Let me say this to you. This does not, you need to read this. You and I need to read this properly. This does not mean that God's people will not fall on hard times. It means that David... I have been young, now I'm old. Hear David speak, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken. In his experience, it doesn't mean that would never, in real life, I've seen plenty of people be in need and want. In his experience, he says, he's not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. So let me talk about the provision of God, which is not limited to, as I want to reinforce, not limited to, Money, it's not limited to food, but God's provisions to take care of you. So let's first start with the most important place God can take care of you, and that is your soul. People who understand why they are Christians, you have a head start beyond most. There are a lot of people who don't know why they're Christians. They have no clue. They're born into it. They, it's a good place to bring your kids because your kids can have entertainment. It's a rock show for you. You get to feel good about going to uh, a 30-minute service that's got 10 minutes of word and 20 minutes of music. I don't know. I'm just saying that 
the provision that God makes for the ones that are interested. You know, you've heard me say that the, the phrase, be a Berean. A Berean simply means someone who's taken the time to search out, like someone who's going to say, I want to check this out. I'm going to study this thing. I'm going to find out. The Lord provides something for our soul to have that contact, to desire. It goes back, back to the path to desire him and to desire the things of him, which when we talk about provision, first and foremost, he's given me clarity. My soul, now trusting him, it's not I don't believe once saved, always saved, but my soul is in his hands. I've turned to him. I have stopped going about my way as in it's all about me. I'm doing my thing. I've turned to him, which is what we understand is the definition of essentially when we talk about sinning or sin, it is turning from my way to follow and go his way. So when we talk about provision, the first one is the provision for the soul. Now we get so hung up and fixated on exterior. Let's talk about the interior. The soul is connected to the mind. The mind must have thoughts about God, about mortality, about existing, about the how-tos. I mean, tell me, is there anybody in the sound of my voice that hasn't sought and asked questions which you may or may not have the answer to, but you, you might even ask yourself, why am I even here on this earth? Why did God put me here? And as I told you, no one can ask more questions than yours truly. But the provision that God gives first to the soul and then to the mind is the ability that he gives the provision he gives for me to recognize that I'm not my own, I'm bought with a price, that I need to be saved, I need a deliverer, I cannot save myself. And that once that the eyes have been opened, I recognize there is a whole dimension of my life spelt out in this book that not only enriches the now, but tells me that I don't really have to worry about what will happen in the future because God's got it under control. So when I talk about provisions, I don't want us to just jump into thinking all that God is a dispenser of things tangible because first and foremost, he is a dispenser of grace and of mercy for none of us, not one of us deserves that he would condescend to come and touch us in our hearts and minds. So that provision, just right there, that deity, the what is beyond our comprehension, would even deign to come near this sin-contaminated vessel. That's a great provision in and of itself. And if I were to add to this list, I'd say at the top of the list that the Lord provided his son, his only begotten son, to die on the cross, to pay for my sins, that I may be forgiven. These are the provisions I feel like many times are lost. But within this psalm, the provisions that God is talking about is not just substance, but that God will provide justice, that God will provide the needs. And it may not happen now. I've said this before. You know, the age-old question, why doesn't God do something about this? Well, don't think that he's not. Uh, I'd say tread very carefully on what you think there. But it's important to understand that the Lord will always provide for his own. Be careful in not succumbing to this craziness that became the prosperity nut factory that's preached almost on every street corner, which is if you come to God, you're going to become rich. Your pockets will be overflowing. You've heard me say the martini scripture that people so love to quote. No, I've said, actually, if you come, you might find yourself fall on hard times. In fact, I'll ask the, just the people in the sanctuary here. When you first came, or maybe throughout the course of your faith walk, could you look back and say, you've had, God has been great, but you've had bumpy times where there were times you weren't sure that you were going to make it. And most of the hands went up. So what I'm saying to you is, this is the lot of the Christian. 
And I feel it's my responsibility to tell people, listen, don't come and think God's going to enrich you and he's going to line your pockets and you're going to have big gold stacks in the pants and the pockets. And it doesn't work that way. In fact, you may find yourself being on the border, just on the cusp of being destitute. There's an interesting thing that I've seen happen. How many times have you heard me say this? People start watching. They say, I just became a king's house. They're so excited. And then I'll get a message a month or two later. I lost my job. I'm about to lose my house. My dog does like a bad country western song, right? But the truth of the matter is that there is usually some bumpiness that's accompanied with the Christian faith, which is why I said the provision that the Lord provides is unmatched and the enemies. They can't even fathom it. That's why they have to basically steal. They have to take. Man, I could go off on this right now because in my mind, trust me, I've been through a whole litany of people stealing and trying to take, if you can imagine. But what I want to stay focused on is how he provides and the graciousness of his provision. Next, let's talk about purpose. You know, the wicked people, they have to kind of come up with one. They have to come up with a purpose. They have to invent something because they don't don't got it. They don't have anything. They don't have a purpose. Their purpose, they think, is to uh, persecute the righteous, is to do whatever it is they do. But for those that are called of God, the righteous ones, let's talk about his purpose. So for that, let's look at verse 26 and 27. And actually, I may read a little bit into verse 28. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. My purpose and yours. It's kind of a, an interesting way to look at this. God called you into the kingdom to be his child, to spend eternity together. God called you and called me for a purpose. I'm not just called so that I can walk around and I have a title. I'm a Christian. And the Christian means a follower of Christ. This is my my other frustration, if I may. You have no choice. You're a captive audience. This is my frustration. People say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. Are you? And I don't mean that as to question. It's not my business to question, but just understand what the terminology of Christian means. It means little Christ or follower of Christ. And yet those very people that say, I'm a Christian, if I ask them, what did they learn at church today? And I'm not talking about people that attend here but may listen to other preachers and go to other churches. Well, I don't know, it just felt really good today, you know. The pastors had just just some good encouraging words. What? You're... Eternal life depends on it. What did you learn? This, this is God's place of education. It is not the freak show people have made it into. You're supposed to come here and learn about God so that you can understand your purpose. And your purpose is not, sorry, one of the better known freaks. Actually, I think this individual's a pervert, but anyway. And I don't, mean, I don't mean in the sexual way. I mean perverted as in misleading people in the thought process. You know, if you, kind of a little bit more like Norman Vincent Peale. Just think positively. It'll all work out. No. Find your purpose with God. Know what it is. And the purpose is not, I'm here preaching You're listening. The purpose, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to develop. It's what Ephesians talks about, to grow into and to develop into the image and likeness of his son. That is all of a microcosm deposit of Christ's nature in us that begins to transform us, to make us into the sons and daughters we were intended to be and now can be in God's eyes. That happens because we trust and faith in Christ. So when we understand what our purpose is, we can talk about this in other ways, but let's talk about this. God's protection. Once you figure out that God has a plan for you, there is a purpose in your life, let's talk about God's protection. And 
or we can talk about being preserved, but God's protection specifically in the body of this psalm. I want you to see how, for example, when it says, the seed of the wicked shall be cut off, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forevermore. Do you realize that this psalm, by the way, is not just about current events, but it's also speaking about a future time. It's also speaking a, a prophecy about the future that's yet to come. But in the now, what's so important, what's imperative to glean in the now is that God says, things may happen to you. Bad things may happen. And they they do, all day long, unfortunately. But God says, when he talks about his protection, we are to run. There's a passage in the Psalms that talks about running to the shelter of his wings. We are to run to him. We are to search him out through his word. And come to him. But don't think for a minute, for someone who is conversing and communing with God, that God would see injustice and let it go. See, this is the missing ingredient of today's society that is godless and doesn't care about this book or about somebody bigger than themselves. This is the issue. God will take care. You know, I talked about this in the series on heaven and hell. We will all stand and give account. And that includes, for those of us who are in Christ, we will stand. That's not the place of judgment. Because we are in Christ, we will not be judged like that. There's no condemnation for us. It's not like you're going to go to hell. But for those people who will stand and will have to give account of their plotting against and how they persecuted Christians and how they obtained their prosperity and even how they thought they would be void and immune of punishment or that they made vows taking money or things or words and never intending to make good on. God says, don't think that just as the ledger is being recorded of your life and your behavior, don't think that that individual is not being and all of their deeds and acts are not being recorded as well. So when I say God will have the last word, in between, I recognize this even in my life. God didn't spare me from certain things, but while I was going through, I realized and recognized God was protecting me. There's many times where people have kind of tried to bring me into battle, lure me into battle. I've said to you, there's only one way that you will engage me, and that is protecting the church. I really don't care. I'll just say it now. I'll say it. I probably said it 10,000 times already. I don't care if the world likes me or hates me. I wasn't brought here for that purpose. I wasn't brought here to try and win the affection of the world. I know I came, like Esther, came to the kingdom for this hour to stand and to unabashedly preach and proclaim the power of God If we simply look to him, there's no funny stuff, there's no woo-woo-woo, it's out there. Look to him, be in this book, have communication and communion with God. These are the things that are important. And this is where, this brings me to my last P here, which is position. You might think you are walking the walk of faith, And you are. But maybe the stuff you see around you makes you think you're not in the right position to do anything about the circumstances. And that's why I'll tell you you're wrong. The unfortunate part is that people tend to go about things taking matters into their own hands. Sometimes you need to do that. But we are positioned as Christians with an advantage over these people over here. And I'll tell you what it is. Preveniently, as he opened my eyes and opened my heart and my ears to be able to hear and receive the message, in that moment, I was transitioned out of the kingdom of darkness into his glorious kingdom of light, which is what the scripture talks about. That position, it's not as though I stay there and I'm secure in that. My position is maintained through faithing and trusting him on an ongoing, regular basis. But the difference between these two people is that as I was called by him into his kingdom 
And if I look at all of the, the concepts I've laid out here, he put me on a path, he has provided, he's made a way. Let me speak for me first. You can probably all fill in the blanks, but let me, let me put all this together in my life. As I said, the path, who could have imagined that I would have ended up here? But God knew that. I didn't. The provision that he made in his economy, he doesn't just see provision as food or money, but things that we need in order to function in the place for the purpose that he's called us to. And then the protection and the position, which I think go hand in hand, which he has more than shown to me, that doesn't mean that life is perfect, but it means it's perfect because of him. It doesn't mean that it's flawless or without problems. It just means I know the power of his presence. I know that there are these two types of people. This psalm helps me to understand that maybe in the now some of these will be prospering. In fact, I was just telling somebody the other day, I said, I don't understand this. Why God would take a brilliant mind like Dr. Scott, who had, what, 30 years here, 20 years before, so 50 years of ministry. But then, kind of, you know, it's kind of goofy. Like, I've talked to God about this. God, why'd you take him for the voice, for the teaching voice, for the understanding, for the communication that he offered and the understanding of God's word, but you leave a whole series of goofballs out there calling themselves Christian ministers. One guy's done prison time, and all he does is sell emergency end-time food. Another guy, all he can do is pick his head and his nose most of the time when he's on TV. There's nothing being offered into the Christian community in terms of substance, information, teaching. And I, I would often complain to God about this. Like many other things that are not just and not fair and not right, God says, you're focusing in the wrong place. Now, God hasn't spoke to me audibly, but from his word, you're focusing in the wrong place. I'll take care of those people, even the ones that are preaching the doctrine that's misleading many people. I'll take care of these wicked ones. You have one mission, and that's to keep teaching faith and my word. So I I kind of put this all before him and say, yeah, there are two groups of people. And if I look carefully, I see that in the big picture, if I'm really looking at what God's saying, God says, don't think that I don't see what's going on in the world even today. Don't think that I don't know the injustices or the imbalances. Don't think that I don't know all this. And for the ones who are, I'm speaking as though I'm quoting what God would be saying, if he could audibly, if we could hear him, quit focusing on that group of people. They'll get theirs. You just keep focusing on me, and I'll take you all the way. I'll take care of you. You're on the path I put you on. I gave you provision. Maybe you don't see it, but I've provided for you. You have a purpose, which is more than these other people. Their whole purpose is to persecute, to make trouble, to to try and get you off the course. And that's why God says, I've given you the protection. First and foremost, by the way, in the form of my spirit, living in you, giving you the ability to know, to hear that small, still voice. And finally, the position that boils down to this. You're either a child of God or you're not. You're either looking to him and trusting him or you're not. You're either meddling in other people's business, busybody, gossiping, troublemaking, or you're just looking to stay the course with God. That's why I said there's only two groups of people And for those of us who, I say this carefully, we are righteous because of his righteousness, not because of anything we have, but because we trust him. Just like Abraham, I explained this last week, it explains it very clearly in Romans 4, how because Abraham trusted God, it was imputed to him. The righteousness of God was imputed to him. He was put in right standing with God, although Abraham wasn't perfect. When God looked at Abraham through those spectacles, he saw perfection because he saw the faith, the garment that he wore, will now say on the inside, the garment we wear internally, the Spirit of God, which brings us to that place of saying, I know he cares about me, and I'm on that side of the ledger for a reason. God put me here. 
I'm not a social justice warrior. I'm not here to talk about the injustices of the world as we know it. I'm here to remind you today that if you're trusting Christ, Christ has got your back. And this wickedness, whether it's in this psalm, and you want to leave the words on the paper, or whether the wickedness is the things you see about you in this day and age, or whether it's actuality happening to you today, if you're trusting him, you can kind of take comfort in something. He knows what you're going through, and he also knows the other side of the ledger. The things promised to the people of God, listen carefully, go back and read it again. He says, those folks will inherit the earth. The inheritance they have is forever. These may have prosperity, but it will not be lasting, and it will not carry them into eternity. It will actually take them to hell. Now, I'm not so worried and so riled up about all this because I just told you, God's in control. Hopefully today, if you're one of those people that just feel a little bit overwhelmed by the left side of the ledger right there, take comfort. God sees what you're going through, knows what's in your mind and your heart, and he cares about you. So I strongly suggest going back to reread and see I'm maybe not perfect because nobody is, but I'm on the side of the ledger looking unto him who is able to handle all my problems, all the people who are plotting, who are trying to do, and is able to see this is my time to just stand and say, God has ordered my steps, and I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm simply going to say, I know who will make the trip with me. He'll, he has promised to not leave me nor forsake me, so I know I'm in good hands. How about you? If you've chosen that path today and you're walking with him, then let's just all say we are going through because God's in control. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.